Welcome to press number 153. We're talking about how to make SUVs less draggy. We're looking at a couple of different modifications. One is for the roof, and then there is one for the center of the car. And I'm not talking about the underbody, but literally going straight through the car. And the reason why these modifications are so important is because SUVs are not the most aerodynamic cars going around. They are very blocky, and while most other cars can get their drag coefficients below 0.3, and quite easily I should add, SUVs struggle to get even to 0.35 and that makes their shapes 20 or even 40% worse for drag than other cars. And even today, like most cars really try to get to 0.25 for the drag coefficient, even 0.3 is pretty bad. So 0.35 is even worse than that again. So you have to use a lot more fuel when your drag is that higher, which costs money and who wants to do that? No one wants to pay money. So it's easy to understand why it is difficult to make SUVs have better drag coefficients. The first reason is because obviously of the general shape. They are much bigger and rectangular than re regular sedans or hatchbacks and we buy them for that. We can fit more stuff in them and yes that stuff is very functional and helpful but it is also just emotionally comfortable, comforting to know that you can drive around with more of your worldly possessions with you. Another major reason why SUVs have such terrible drag coefficients is because of safety standards. So you may not know this, but all cars have to follow certain safety standards for pedestrians. For example, the front of the car has to be a certain height above the ground because if it hits a pedestrian, the goal is to do as little damage as possible and based on the average sizes of humans and the fact that there are kids around, etc., we need to make these cars such that in the event that they do hit someone, they hit the most robust part of the person, that way the injuries are reduced. What's more, the vehicle's shape greatly affects the stability at higher speeds. When we tr start to travel faster, the aerodynamic forces on the car increase, and if they are out of balance, then the car could lose control. For example, if the car simply produces too much lift, then the lift will overcome its weight and the driver will have little control. Alternatively, if the front produces a lot more lift than the rear, or vice versa, stability problems can occur. Or, as we covered in a recent automotive aerodynamics video on our YouTube channel, called Automotive Aero 24, how front wheel, rear wheel, and all wheel drive affect aerodynamics. The side force and where it occurs affects whether the car will create an unstable feedback loop or not. So some cars, actually if there's a, a side wind, they will create a side force and then these cars will produce more and more side force in a certain way to actually veer it off course even more. Other cars will uh, produce like this restorative moment to reduce this side force and as I mentioned you can find that in that video called how front wheel rear wheel and all wheel drive affect aerodynamics on our YouTube channel so we want to make our cars aerodynamics aerodynamically stable we don't want them to lose their stability and those those requirements mean that you can't just shape an SUV how you'd like and that is what we are going through in this podcast we're going to go through a few different ways that don't change the SUV shape very much, but maybe they will change the drag coefficient, or maybe they won't. I don't want to give away any spoilers. So the paper that we are looking at is called Improvement of the Aerodynamic Be Behavior of a Passenger Car by Using a Combined Ditch and Base Bleed. And it's open access, you can find it in the link in the description. So the title is a little cryptic, but the paper isn't. So let's jump into it. Figure one shows the car that they are using, and it's the good old, good old Land Rover Discovery. It's a very blocky car and one of the most boxy ones on the road. So this is a good candidate for modifications because this has a lot to work with. So in this study, the researchers are using CFD, which kind of makes sense because it would be hard to make some of these modifications to Discovery. I mean, you'd have to buy a perfectly good Discovery and then just start hacking into the roof. This figure two shows one of the modifications. So we have this one is a little tricky to understand from the picture, but I'll do my best to explain it. So in essence, it is literally just a tube running from the front of the vehicle all the way through from the grill and to the back. From a theoretical point of view, this is a very sensible modification to make because cars experience very high pressure around the grill area. And this is because you have all this fast moving flow coming from left, let's say, crashing into the front and dumping all of this kinetic energy into the vehicle. So logically, if you can prevent that from happening, you can reduce the car's drag. And that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to bleed off these, this like fast moving flow, directing it through the car to the back, which is also a great idea because the rear of the cars experience quite low pressure as well, which means that more pressure drag is created if you 
don't have this softening effect. So if you don't know about a car's pressure drag, watch our YouTube channel uh, and our video on there called Automotive Aerodynamics Number 3, Pressure and Friction Drag of Cars Explained. So you can just look that up and you'll find that video which will explain what I'm talking about here if you don't know what I'm talking about. So one thing to note is that this siphoning off can't be done through a simple straight tube from the front to the rear. And that is because you have other parts of the car in the way. For example, the interior with the people. So if you were to have this straight line going straight through, it would cut through and then like the people wouldn't they'd have like this tube going through the middle of the car that people have to like climb over to get in. So the tube has to wind through a little and every time you redirect the flow, you lose a little bit of energy and increase the drag. So it's important to reduce the number of turns. And I'm not sure if these researchers could do this, but another way that they um, could have the tube is well, they have the tube here, it's fairly sharp with the turns. And if the geometry allowed, it would be better to make the turns more round because that will reduce the amount of losses. The reason why is because if you have quite sharp turns, imagine you have all this flow coming in and it travels along, hits this corner and you pretty much have this almost vertical face that it hits and it has to be redirected down. As opposed to if it's curved, it will follow up more gently and the energy won't be dumped into the surface of the car. So anyway, let's move on to the second modification. This modification can be seen in figure three and it's quite a cool idea. So essentially they took the roof and cut it into a duct. And now this duct isn't completely closed. It's more like a three quarter duct with the roof being open to the free stream and you have the sides here. The researchers said they wanted to look into this modification because they wanted to increase the pressure on the top of the car, probably to reduce the car's lift for the reason we discussed earlier, where you want to have lower lift of the car to make it more stable on the ground. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not really sure how this design is supposed to work. I mean, <laughs> they have a converging diverging duct here. So what happens is that the air coming in is more or less the free stream velocity. And it's of a certain pressure. Then when it hits the contraction, so this part here, it will start to accelerate. And when you accelerate the flow, the pressure drops. Then when it exits the contraction, it slows down and the pressure will rise again, but it won't rise to any higher than the entering flow was anyway. So you have possibly lower pressure here. I'm not really sure, as I mentioned, how this is supposed to work. Arguably design, this design would be less stable. But there is one idea that might happen, and that is because you're cramming all of this air into the into the duct, that might create a back pressure, which then would increase the pressure up here at the front of the car. But I'm not sure if that would happen or not. Let's find out later. So what's more, this duct is obviously open to the rest of the free stream flow, which makes it less effective because the air can escape and not get accelerated or decelerated as much. So let's say you have the flow coming in and you have all this air in front of it that's trying to go through as well and accelerating. Well, the flow can go through, it can wait its turn and go through, or it can just jump over the top depending on what the pressure dictates. So that's one potential problem, which um, you can't really be, can't be helped here. But that's one thing we have to keep in mind. So let's find out together how all this roof duct stuff works. We're going to discuss the CFD setup first and then the results. So the CFD domain is shown in figure four and it's very good. So the domain is very large and good enough to not really influence the flow physics. They refine the mesh more and more as you get closer to the car, which is good because you that is where, this is where you not only have large scale features, but also smaller scale features and it's important to resolve them adequately to get an accurate result. So figure nine shows us the Y plus. And if you don't know what the Y plus is, it tells us how to refine, how refined the boundary layer is in the boundary layer um, like region and effectively how well we're capturing the boundary layer flow physics. A Y plus value of one or even less is ideal, but that comes at the cost of a lot more elements. So a Y plus value of one or less means that we are really capturing the important parts of the boundary layer in terms of our mesh. If it's like 30 or 60, it means that we have like such a big mesh that the stuff close to the surface is not really um, being resolved and we have to rely on things called wool functions, which we'll talk about in a second. So for this setup, the car has a Y plus value of around 120, which is far too high for most turbulence models. I should mention they're using RANS here and it's not new RANS either, it's just regular steady state RANS. So any turbulence model with a specific rate of dissipation or simply known as Amiga, so the K Amiga, SST Amiga is no good because these models need a Y plus value below five. The reason why some models can handle Y plus values above, well above five 
and others can't is whether they use these things called wall functions as I mentioned. So wall functions are functions that help us have an idea of what is happening close to the wall without actually having to solve the equations there. So in other words, you don't need to refine the cells there. You just say, okay, I know what it is at one certain point, then I can just use this wall function to approximate what it would be at another point without actually having to solve it. So the downside of these wall functions is that they're not 100% accurate. They're good approximations and each simulation is different though. So you not, so you may only get a good guess, but not the exact solution. So because I can see that the y, this y plus here is very high, well above five or 10, I can immediately tell without even looking at the data that they couldn't have used a turbulence model with Amiga or even an SST model because they need y plus values of less than five, ideally around one, 0 0.5 or one. If you use these models, you're gonna get pretty wrong results. So one really cool thing they looked into was how different velocities affect the results. They looked at 28 meters per second, 34 meters per second, and 40 meters per second. And this is quite uncommon because most car manufacturers really only look at one velocity, and that velocity is usually around 40 meters per second, so about 140 kilometers per hour. And the turbulence intensity for the CFD was 2.65, and that was to match the turbulence intensity the turbulence intensity level of the Myra wind tunnel. So that's good. So for those of you who don't know, Myra was, is a, um, like one of probably the top three wind tunnels in the world for like non, um, like they're not owned by any car manufacturer. They're owned by a independent group and then car manufacturers go there to test their cars. And it's fitted with a lot of technology. Um, so Myra is a very common wind tunnel there. So the reason, but back to this turbulence intensity level of 2.65, the reason why the turbulence density level is so high is because this better approximates real life. In fact, one major flaw is in many car manufacturers' wind tunnel is that the turbulence density used is so low, like 0.4%. But you almost never get such a low turbulence density in real life. So a higher one is more indicative of real life conditions, generally speaking. So let's move on to table one because they do a great breakdown of the key assumptions made in their research. You almost never get to see this. And it's great because every automotive aerodynamics can really conclude these things by themselves. So you're not really, by not including them, you're not really hiding anything, um, but it's just nice to have them all in one spot to look at. So for this research, the major bad assumption is that there is no, there are no rotating wheels, as you can see here. In real life, we do have rotating wheels, obviously the car has to go somewhere, but in their experiments and in the CFD subsequently, they don't have rotating wheels. One good thing is that most of their CFD matches quite nicely the experimental setup. Um, but for this research, with this um, assumption of no rotating wheels, the results will be about 5% different to what they should be. And there are some cases where the rotating wheels can change trends, but generally speaking, there is only around a 5% offset for the lift and drag um, values and even the side force, and et cetera. So there are some minor assumptions that aren't too big a deal. For example, the engine doesn't run or reject exhaust gases. This is definitely something you'd like to have because it would make the research a little more accurate. But for a general idea of the effects of the car mods, it's not necessary. So another assumption is no cooling flow in effect. And this again, isn't that big of a deal. The changes, it changes the magnitudes, but not really the trends very much. So it is really, only the rotating wheels that poses the biggest potential problem here. So let's move on to the grid independent study. They have a nice graph here in figure 10 that shows the the, the K, K epsilon um, terminus model and the effects that it has on the drag coefficient when you go above a certain number of elements. So they went from about like 2 million cells all the way up to 21 million cells almost. And we see that above 13 million cells, the increase in number of cells doesn't really affect the drag coefficient too much. And that is a little surprising to me because in my experience for a car of this size, you should really have about 100 million cells and, and really even higher. If you needed 200 million cells, I wouldn't be surprised, primarily because that is how many cells I have always needed to do meshes of um, these cars and to get an independent mesh. But perhaps the dramatic reduction in the number of cells comes from no wheel rotation and as well as using the capsule model which reduces the boundary layer um, like inflation layers so the simplifications of the tires as well uh, as i mentioned here they um, assumed that the tires were smooth that also reduces the number of cells so perhaps with all these simplifications maybe 13 million cells is all we really need 
Um, I'm not too sure here. I guess I'd have to take their research as it is. Uh, one interesting, th one good thing to note is that they really changed their number of cells by a long way. So they went from like 2 million all the way up to 21 million. So that's a 10 times increase, which is which covers a really nice um, range of, of, of number of cells. So we can get a good idea as to when this mesh became independent. So this is a nice grid independent study. It's a, you could argue it's a bit of overkill, but overall we get a good picture, so that's good. So in table two, they have their validation study. And unsurprisingly, only the realizable capsulon terminus model did well with only 0.028% difference to the wind tunnel measurements for the drag coefficient. The K Amiga, SST, and Reynolds shear stress models were uh, much worse, as you'd expect, because they have because this CFT had a high Y plus value, and these models are not capable of giving you good results with this, and that's why we get such a such a, such bad results. Whereas the K epsilon models, they are well known to be able to handle these high Y plus, y plus values, but um generally speaking they're not usually that accurate anyway but because we don't have rotating walls and we've simplified the geometry a lot um they can i guess handle it in this situation so in figure 13 we get our first taste of the real results and before moving further i should probably say with the cft setup i quite liked it they did a nice job in terms of their grid independent study they did a nice job in terms of their validation data and overall i'd probably say that this cft setup is like a seven or eight out of ten for their you know, thoroughness um, some issues are just their simplifications that they made to their vehicle. Um, but overall, 7 or 8 out of 10 is pretty good. So in figure three, uh, sorry, figure 13, um, we see streamlines going around the land over river discovery with the different modifications. And figure 13a is the streamlines going around the standard land rover. Let me zoom in a little bit so we can get a better look here. A looky loo. Um, okay, so the results here are quite expected. We saw similar results in podcast number 83, actually, called Aerodynamic Modifications of Sports Utility Vehicles. And in the rear, we see m most of the action. We see two distinct vortices forming, one here, one there. The lower one is much bigger, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's stronger. It also depends on how concentrated they are. Apart from that, there isn't much else uh, to point out maybe that the flow from underneath the vehicle is shooting up quite a lot at a steep angle so let's move on to figure 13b which is where we see the discovery with a ventilation duct remember the ventilation duct is where we're getting air from the front of the vehicle and we have this tube going all the way through the vehicle and this air follows that and shoots out the back so now we have fast moving flow moving from the front into the back and that's taking up that slow moving flow region so you would definitely expect that the vortices were affected considering that you now have fast moving flow being introduced literally in the middle of them shooting straight through and we do see some significant changes for example the top vortex right here is much bigger than the bottom vortex now and also because the top vortex is occupying such a, so much more space the lower vortex has been moved down a little bit as for how much the flow from underneath the car shoots up it kind of looks the same to me as figure 13a if anything i might say that it shoots up um it doesn't shoot up as much but they are very similar uh, so let's look at how the roof affected the roof modification affected the discovery streamlines this is found in figure 13c so figure 13c we probably see the greatest changes here out of all these figures and the lower vortex looks much more concentrated because you see many more streamlines being sucked into it and it's not really that much bigger than what it was for the um, unmodified case so i'm pretty comfortable saying that it's probably more concentrated um, the upper vortex doesn't seem to exist anymore so the upper like the roof modification seemed to stop one vortex forming and that isn't surprising when you consider that the upper vortex forms just past the roof so it seems like the roof greatly affects the upper vortex formation. And perhaps the lower vortex is only more concentrated now because there is, isn't another vortex of opposite sign reducing its energy. 
or it might also be that the lower vortex isn't actually more concentrated, but there is no other vortex around sucking streamlines away. That is also a possibility, but I think it's probably more concentrated. So interestingly, when we move to figure 13D, we have both the ventilation modification on the roof and the vent and the sorry the ventilation modification and the roof modification. Uh, that they're together, their effects are about halfway between each one of them separately. So the lower vortex appears to be much more concentrated than if you had just the ventilation mod. So let's move up to figure 13b here, where we see the lower vortex. Here it's simply more concentrated, but not as concentrated as when we just have the roof modification. So it's about halfway between. And here there's still some semblance of the upper vortex. So remember for the roof modification, the upper vortex really got just annihilated or even, I guess, didn't even exist. Um, and then for the ventilation modification, there was a significantly greater upper vortex. So this upper vortex for the roof modification with the ventilation modification together is kind of halfway between these two. So does that mean that these two modifications kind of work against each other? Well, let's look at figure 19 to see the drag coefficient data. Let me zoom out as well. So figure 19, we will see the drag coefficient. Here we go. And we have, that's probably a little bit too much. Here we go. Okay. So in effect, I would say yes, these two modifications are at odds with each other in terms of the drag coefficient effects. And the reason why I say that is because if you look at the black line, this top one here, this is the drag coefficient just for the baseline discovery with the modifications. On the other hand, the red line is the discovery with the ventilation duct. And we see a really nice drag reduction here. And across the Reynolds number range investigated from 9 million to 30 million, the reduction is around 50 counts. That's <laughs> really good going. The green line is the drag coefficient when you just have the roof modification, and we see almost no change in the drag coefficient, perhaps a couple counts, but that is definitely within the error bars, so we can't really conclude anything here. But when we have the ventilation duct with the roof modification combined, this blue line, the drag coefficient reduction is about only half of just that with the ventilation duct alone. It's about 20 counts, maybe 25 counts, so it's about halfway between these two values. So in other words, the roof modification seems to work against the ventilation duct and make it less effective at reducing the drag coefficient. And this is also obvious from figure 14, sorry, figure 14, sorry, figure 18, not 14. I know I'm saying that, which shows the pressure coefficient on the rear of the car. So here we have the four uh, configurations here. And the maximum pressure coefficient is about the same for the baseline discovery and the discovery with the roof modification, which is this figure 19B, 18B here, sorry. And when you add the duct, the maximum pressure coefficient increases a lot in the back here, which will reduce the drag coefficient a lot. If anything, the roof modification just really shifts the maximum pressure coefficient upwards, which will change the car's moment, but not really the drag coefficient very much. So this is just the drag coefficient though, but remember that the lift coefficient is also important because that affects the car's stability as well. So in table four, we see the lift coefficient of the car with different, different modifications, as well as the drag coefficient. And pretty much all modifications reduce the lift coefficient, which makes the car produce even downforce. So that's pretty good. And this, in this particular case, the roof modification did the best job by reducing the, drag, the lift coefficient by 200 counts, as we can see about here. And funnily enough, in this particular case, the ventilation duct actually holds the roof modification back and but from being more effective. So remember in the drag coefficient, the ventilation duct is great, um, but the roof modification isn't great. But for the lift coefficient, the roof modification is great and the ventilation duct isn't so great. So what this means is that if you want benefits from both the lift and drag, you need both of these modifications and you have to deal with not being able to maximize the gains of each one. So if you want to just reduce the drag, okay, just use the ventilation duct, but not the roof modification. If you want to reduce the lift, okay, just use the roof mod and not the ventilation duct. So that's a pretty cool compromise there. And with that, my literary analysis, we come to the end of this podcast. We found that as expected, the ventilation duct was a really good 
tool for reducing the drag coefficient, as the researchers suspected. And the roof modification was good for reducing the lift coefficient. I really like this podcast, and if you did too, please hit the like button and subscribe or follow, depending on which platform you're listening to this on and or watching. And if you want to get better at aerodynamic theory or CFD, check out our courses in the link in the description. And if you want to get, make your experiments to 4% more accurate, get yourself an absolute hawk. The reason why is that this is an instrument that accurately measures the density of air. The reason why it's important is because the density of air changes all the time. For example, when you come into your wind tunnel in the morning, then come back after lunch, the density of air has changed by a few percent in just a few hours. The density of air is also affected by the temperature, barometric pressure, and humidity. So having you even in your wind tunnel changes the density of air because you're pumping out heat and you're pumping out water from breathing and or talking. Hopefully you're breathing and talking at the same time and not just talking, um, but breathing is essential. So what's more, the density of air changes even more than 2-4% to between days, weeks, months and seasons. 10-15% to changes are very normal, which means that you need to take them into account in your experiments because imagine if like your density is 10 or 15% off, well your uh, dynamic pressure, which is how you measure the velocity of wind tunnel, is off as well by a, <laughs> a lot. Uh, so you need to get that error out of your data. What's more, if you don't take them into account, then not only are those most of the things you're finding just random error, but trying to use your experimental data to fill out your CFD won't work, and that is one of the major problems why people have trouble validating their CFD. It's not that the CFD is wrong, it's that the density of air they use in their CFD is not the same as the density of air they had in their experiments. So of course they're not going to line up. So get yourself an atmosphere hawk, it makes your experiments and CFD more accurate. You can find it in the link in the description, and I'll see you next podcast. Peace and amigos.